the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Come, Holy Ghost, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and enkindle them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray. God is only begotten Son. And by the Holy Ghost, grant the body given that same spirit to enrich the wise, and rejoice in this consolation. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, and is now, and it shall be, world without end. Amen. Our Lady of Lords, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So it's certainly wonderful to. Thank you. So it's certainly wonderful to be with you here on this great Marian feast, the feast of Our Lady of Lourdes, as Father was just explaining. It's great that he gave us all that background on St. Bernadette and the apparitions so that I can skip that part and get to other parts of the talk. Primarily what I wanted to do today is two things. One is draw a connection for you between Our Lady of Lourdes and Our Lady of Fatima. I do that because sometimes I encounter what I would say is a slight error, it seems, or an odd way of thinking, maybe, where people somehow think that it's, I don't know, two different ladies because one's called Lourdes and one's called Fatima, or like, well, I've got a devotion to Lourdes, but I don't have a devotion to Guadalupe or, or Fatima or something like that. So, I mean, you may encounter that every now and then. Don't know if anyone ever has. Um, but I have, and that always strikes me as strange because it's obviously the holy and blessed mother of God. It's, it's one person. She's coming from God, and she's essentially bringing the same message. So same person and same message. And it's, imp it's imperative, very important for us to recognize the continuity in that message and to see how they fit together. It's like any good parent with his children. You're the same parent, and ultimately, as you're raising them, you're always trying to give them the same message of how you're gonna help them become responsible, good Catholic adults who save their souls and help save the souls of others. Now, obviously, you teach them a little different when they're three and four than when they're seven and eight, and when they're 15 and 16, and even when they're 20, 30, and 40. You're, you're teaching them, but they might be slightly different lessons, but they're always in continuity. And so it's important for us to see that with, obviously, the greatest father of all, God our Father, that he's doing the same, and our mother is doing the same. So that's part of what we want to understand, the continuity, specifically between Lourdes and Fatima, because it's very strong there. Uh, but I also wanted to broaden it a little bit. And, and go beyond just Lourdes and Fatima to try to show this continuity in the message that Our Lady has been bringing us for a very, very long time. And I wanted to place that in the context of really God's ultimate plan. Like, so when we speak of Our Lady doing something, it's obviously also God that is doing that. They're working hand in hand. As Our Lady says, not my will, but thy will be done. We could say that is the constant always attitude of our Blessed Mother. She's constantly saying, not my will, but thy will. And in many ways, that's the perfection of the spiritual life, if we can achieve that. So basically, what we have is taking a panorama of all history. And Father was even talking about Genesis. So yes, going back to Genesis, panorama of all history up to the end of time. God's got a plan, and it follows his right order. The devil, on the other hand, has a counter plan, which is to create chaos and disorder and completely upturn God's plan. And in fact, when I use the word revolution, that's specifically what I'm referring to. A revolution is to destroy God's right order. And so the devil is always seeking to ape God and to flip things around and to create chaos and disorder. So where God places one thing in a hierarchical order, the devil will come and try to flatten it all out into egalitarianism, for example. Many other things. God creates man and woman. He created them. And of course, the devil will come and try to mix all that up and confuse it. 
God certainly has a plan, and we see it unfolded throughout the scriptures. If you read the scriptures, you begin to be more and more aware of his plan. Very important for us to sort of be, see not just in the New Testament, but in the Old Testament as well, because what you see in his plan is that he's sort of laying it all out in the Old Testament, sort of like a layer of what he's going to do, we can call it prophecy, and then again, it's, it's repeated, and then again, it's repeated, and then again, it's repeated, and this is how prophecy works, and that's how God is building and teaching us, sort of giving us the lessons again and again, so how many times <laughs> How many times are the people in the Old Testament unfaithful to God and go back to worshiping idols, right? That seems to be the story. And then, of course, God will send them a prophet or a king or a great leader like Moses, and he'll bring them back. And then if you're reading the story, you're thinking, okay, now, you know, they're going to straighten up. They're going to figure it out. They're going to fly right. And then no. And then, and then they fall again. And then again, another great, you know, devastation, cities are destroyed, armies come in, and the people repent, and then they get a, a savior type, someone who prefigures the one and only savior, Jesus Christ our Lord, uh, and, and it kind of keeps repeating, right? We see that in the Old Testament. But we see it in history as well, right? It, it's not like God stopped talking to us or God stopped acting in our lives, in our world, once the last pages of the New Testament were written, he continues. And so when you study history, from your Catholic perspective, throughout the centuries after Christ, the AD, Anno Domini, well, you're still going to see that. And in a particular way, we have this great prophet, a prophetess, who is our Blessed Mother, who comes from heaven with a message. So we certainly want to be looking at that. Jesus will refer to his own plan. Quoting from Mark chapter 4, he says, famous lines, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was alone with the twelve that were with him, and they asked him about the parable, Jesus said to them, To you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God. But to them that are without all things are done in parables, that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand. So God is speaking about a mystery of the kingdom of God that is unfolding, and it's unfolding in this sort of parable form or in this prophetic form so that those who have eyes to see and eyes of faith will see it and recognize, and those who don't have eyes to see and ears to hear will be unaware of it. And that's where grace comes in. And this mystery of God unfolding across time is, is what we're talking about. Now, St. Paul will talk about it as well, for example, in his letter to the Ephesians. You can look that up, first chapter. He talks about the great mystery of his will, God's will. And, and it's a refrain. It's a recurring theme in the New Testament, this mystery, this plan of God. In fact, in the book of the Apocalypse, St. John is saying, now that mystery of God is coming to an end. But as we said, the devil is trying to flip it around. And so the devil's got his own plan, his own, and we call it the mystery of iniquity. And so just as God has a plan that is unfolding, the devil has his own plan that he's unfolding, a mystery of iniquity. And of course, God's is always greater, but the devil's always trying to undermine God's. And if you want to learn a little bit about the mystery of iniquity, which is also going to have those layers, where you can look to St. Paul's second letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 2. I'll read you a little bit from there. Hopefully you recognize some of those things as possibly even happening right now. Now, again, just because they're happening right now doesn't mean that, you know, these are the end times, as I spoke about yesterday, because we've said it happens again and again in a cyclical kind of pattern. But in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, St. Paul says that he's come and he's told his people all these things. Why has he prepared them? Why has he taught them? That you may not be easily moved from your sense, nor be terrified neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by epistle as sent from us, as if the day of the Lord were at hand. In other words, don't get worried. We've taught you. You know the faith. He's going to tell them, stay fast in the faith. But don't be terrified by these things. It's not as if the day of the Lord is at hand right now. Let no man deceive you by any means. For unless there come a revolt first, and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and is lifted above all that is called God or that is worshipped 
and that sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself as if he were God. So this is a famous passage that's referring to the man of perdition. We often refer to him as the Antichrist. I mean, St. John will talk about how there are a number of Antichrists, but the Antichrist is coming at the end of time. This is the man of perdition. And so some of the Thessalonians clearly thought that they were in those days. There were some terrible people, some, some bad Antichrists at that time. And St. Paul's telling them, no, we're not there yet. You know there has to be a great revolt, a great revolution. So anytime an Antichrist comes along, there's going to be a great revolution that sort of lays the groundwork for that because that's the devil upturning God's right order, which is what enables this man who opposes God to assume power and authority. And he, of course, will want to be looked upon as God and worshipped as God and will set himself up in the temple of God so that when men look to where they should be looking to God and worshipping God, they'll instead be looking to and worshipping this man. He continues, remember you not that when I was with you, I told you these things. And now you know what withholdeth that he may be revealed in his time. So the Antichrist has got his time, but something is holding him back. Something withholdeth him. And St. Paul told him what that was. He, he doesn't reveal it here. So the church fathers talk a lot about that. And I've addressed that at other points. But I won't get into that part now because he says, the mystery of iniquity already worketh. Only that he who now holdeth it back do hold it until he be taken out of the way. And then the wicked one shall be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus shall kill with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy him with the brightness of his coming. So the mystery of iniquity is already at work. It's already at work in the time of Paul. It's at work in the time right now. The Antichrist is coming. He'll be killed by God and there's stuff that holds him back so that he doesn't have full power. One of those things that holds him back is the Catholic faith, the Catholic mass, the papacy, St. Michael, our Blessed Mother, but most especially the holy sacrifice of the mass. So if we begin to lose those things, then that means what's holding him back is, you know, if we lose our Marian devotion, you know, if, we have, if, if we lose the papacy, or if there are great problems, schisms in the papacy, uh, those are the kinds of things. We stop having a devotion to St. Michael the Archangel. Uh, you see great sacrileges taking place within the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. Those are these great signs that everything is weakening and things are being set up for the Antichrist to come. But God's got his own plan. So we've got it all set up. There's this great sort of almost like a chessboard with God against the devil, good versus evil. And we know God wins. And I like the analogy of chess because in chess, the most powerful piece is obviously the queen, as she can control the board. And so that, of course, turns us now to look more closely at our Blessed Mother's role within this plan of salvation, because she is absolutely central to it. Without our Blessed Mother, there is no salvation. Because without her, the eternal Son of God, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, does not become man, does not assume a human nature, and does not suffer and die on the cross, die for our sins, and open the gates of heaven. So God has promised that Our Lady will crush the devil's head. And from the beginning of time, that was already the prophecy. So we'll see it unfold in these Marian revelations. Uh, what can we see? I'm going to pick, and they're not all Marian, but I'm going to pick sort of 12. I like 12 because Our Lady has 12 stars on her crown. It's a good number, 12 apostles. Yeah. Nice, complete number. This sort of shows a perfection. So there's certainly more but I've just chosen to highlight 12 today for us. 12 sort of, I would call the major apparitions coming throughout the plan of God that link. And obviously two of the major pillars there are gonna be Lourdes and Fatima. We might ask ourselves, why does God continue to give us this revelation if we already have the scriptures? And I mentioned it's because the plan continues to unfold, but there are other reasons as well. For example, we do need these private revelations, these apparitions of Our Lady, and other messages we get through saints, they often, God gives them so that they clarify, I'm going to give you six reasons. The first one is that they clarify something in public revelation that is often under attack. And so you see that in Lourdes. When our Blessed Mother appeared, she spoke of how she is the Immaculata, the Immaculate Conception. And that was under attack, this denial of Mary's Immaculate Conception, which is why the Pope had to go and proclaim it infallibly. As well as really all 
everything that was supernatural was under attack. There was a denial that there's even a supernatural thing. You know, there was the atheists that deny that you have a soul. And so Lourdes comes to defend many of those teachings. Likewise with Fatima. Our Lady at Fatima emphasizes heaven and hell and purgatory. Those are dogmas of the church that are very much under attack. She emphasizes confession and the holy sacrifice of the mass, also things that are under attack today. She emphasizes the rosary. She emphasizes our need for meditation. She emphasizes our need for reparation to cease offending God. All of these things are really under attack today in our world. So God sends us because it's needed at this time. Or to emphasize something of public revelation that is being neglected when it's not being emphasized sufficiently. Like even Marian devotion. Marian piety has really sort of plummeted in past decades. There are many parishes, unlike this one, where they do not pray the rosary. And even Eucharistic adoration, unlike at this parish, there's many places where they don't have a place where you can adore our Lord or reverence our Lord. And so that is also a kind of piety that is falling by the wayside, and yet our Blessed Mother comes and really emphasizes that. One of the things that the angel does in 1916 when he appears with the three children is he brings the Blessed Sacrament, he holds the chalice with the precious blood, and he holds the sacred host. And he leaves them suspended in the air. And then the angel himself, St. Michael, prostrates himself on the ground and adores the body and the blood, the real presence of Jesus Christ. And he teaches the children to do the same. So then the children do that. So you have a little nine-year-old, a seven-year-old, and a six-year-old adoring God. And they're giving us this great example of what we should be doing as well this great reverence we should have for the Holy Eucharist that in many ways has been lost today. Same thing at Lourdes. I mean, at Lourdes, people said that when St. Bernadette knelt down in front of that grotto, and of course she sees Our Lady in the niche, but other people didn't. But the people there said, we knew Our Lady was there. Simply when Bernadette took her rosary in her hand and made the sign of the cross, they said that alone was the greatest catechetical lesson, catechetical lesson you could get, just to see how Bernadette would make a sign of the cross and would pray, and that it would move them to pray so much, that just seeing her pray moved them to a deeper understanding of what prayer meant, and they knew that she was really talking to someone that was really there, that was really from heaven. While piety was so under attack, and even the Catholic faithful were sort of losing their zeal and were often just going through the motions, not unlike today. And so then God sends us because this is needed. It's a part of revelation that is being neglected. So that's the second reason. The third reason is to strengthen our faith and our hope in a present trial. And so certainly we see that in Fatima, for example, with World War I, uh, but the communism that's going to come up and all the revolutions, Our Lady came to strengthen us in all of these trials. And it lords also. The church was undergoing terrible trials at that time. In many ways, the same trials that we are at now, they were just, they hadn't developed quite as far, but they were already there. The great revolutions that were destroying Europe and destroying Christendom, the last vestiges of Christendom in the 1800s. Another reason is to prepare us for future trials. And there we definitely see Our Lady of Fatima preparing us for future trials, um, as well as Our Lady of Lourdes. One of the things that Our Lady said at Lourdes is thrice, she said, penance, penance, penance. She was calling us to do penance at Lourdes because she was preparing us for future trials and we need to do more penance in reparation for the many sins, blasphemies, sacrileges, and outrages that are, committing, that are being committed against God against his holy name, against the Eucharist, against Our Lady herself. And in the vision of Fatima that the Vatican revealed on June 26, 2000, which is part of the third secret, it starts out with Lucia saying they saw a great angel and he had a flaming sword, which reminds us of Genesis and the angels with the flaming swords there, but that he was hurling flames at the earth and it looked like the earth was going to be consumed by the fire of these flames. So that's obviously a very powerful symbol for God's divine wrath, his just wrath for people who have turned their back against him. And the angel cried, and, and then Our Lady put out her hands and sort of absorbs or stops those flames. 
so that before they can actually hit and destroy the earth, Our Lady dissipates them. That's, of course, Our Lady interceding for us and protecting us. But then the angel cries out, penance, penance, penance. It's like his last word to the earth that we see in this vision. And so as soon as we hear that triple refrain, penance, 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 we should think to ourselves, wow, the angel at Fatima is echoing the very same words that Our Lady said at Lourdes. It's as if in 1858, Our Lady said these things and we did not listen sufficiently. And so in 1917, she's coming again. The angel is coming and we see and. and it's unfortunate to say, but I, w- I mean, I certainly see that it, we haven't really heard that message yet. We have not really taken it to heart that we must do penance, penance, penance. It's actually been almost the exact opposite. I don't know how many of you have sort of studied or are familiar or might even remember from your childhood the kinds of penances that were just normal for Catholics. Some things that were just standard and normal. Every Friday was a day of abstinence. Not just days in Lent, but every Friday of the year was a day of abstinence. Days before big vigil, big, big feasts, the vigils, December 24th before Christmas, August 14th before the Assumption, October 31st before All Saints, and the Vigil of Pentecost, slightly movable feast, so I can't give a date there, but all of those were days of fasting and penance before. I mean, we're still called to fast and do penance on those days before the great feasts. They enable us to celebrate the great feasts better. There were ember days, three days of prayer, fasting, and abstinence located throughout the year, one for each season, one in the winter, one in the spring, one in the summer, one in the fall. Those were the specific days where we prayed for good crops, both from the field, but also from the womb of our wives and our mothers and also for the spiritual life, for priests. Those were days dedicated to pray for priests, and almost every priest back in the day was ordained on an Ember Saturday, because those were days dedicated, prayer and fasting, that the whole church all over the world did for the fruitfulness that we ask God, earth, our own children, and then what we need in the spiritual life, priests and religious vocations. Those days are gone, we don't know them. Rogation days are gone. So there's a lot of fasting and prayer and penances that we did. It used to be, I mean, it was before that if you were going to receive Holy Communion, you fasted from midnight on. You didn't eat until the very first thing that came into your mouth was the most precious body, blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the real presence. Then Pius XII reduced it and said, okay, only three hours. So they became a three-hour fast. And now they've reduced it further. It's like a one-hour fast. Days of fasting by law, church law, today, there's actually only two days of fasting, right? Good Friday and Ash Wednesday. There used to be many more. Same thing with days of abstinence. Now it's just Fridays in Lent that we're supposed to abstain instead of every Friday that we have to do a penance. So it's odd. You see how diabolically disoriented things have gotten when at Lourdes, Our Lady is saying, penance, penance, penance. And then at Fatima in 1917, Our Lady and the Angel are saying, penance, penance, penance. And instead we're like, less penance, less penance, less penance. We're going to do less, we're going to do less. You really begin to see how diabolically disoriented things are. And we need to recover that. Because I think we're all aware that the sin and the offenses against God are growing growing and growing. I mean, we look back at times like maybe the 1920s or like the 1840s, and we might think it was like a golden age. Wow, things were great back then. People were so much more virtuous and things were more modest and pure and the faith was stronger. And that's how we see it from our perspective. And I'm not going to say that's wrong. I think that's true. I think it was better back then in terms of those things. But if the sin is increased, then the reparation and the penance should also have increased. To counter that, again, the two plans, God's plan and the devil's plan. And God's giving us this plan, but if we're not following it, then the devil's plan just keeps getting more steam instead of God's. So we should be looking at ourselves and saying, at this point, and this is actually quoting Sister Lucia in her final public interview. It was given December 26, 1957, to a Mexican priest called Father Agustin Fuentes. I encourage you to read that interview. 
because it's the last time that Sister Lucia spoke publicly on Fatima. It was after that that from an order coming from the Pope in the Vatican, she was silenced and told she could not speak about Fatima anymore, and so she didn't. But I believe in that interview, she was trying to give us like, just the, she kind of knew, I think, it was coming that she was going to get silenced. I mean, there's, it's, that interview is, is filled with a lot of wisdom, and you could really see that she had a very good pulse on what was happening in the world. But one of the things she said there in that interview, she says, you can no longer wait for our religious leaders, our bishops and our priests, to call us to do the penance that we need to do. It, it's not going to come. It's not going to come from them. Each one of us has to do it. Each one of us has to get serious about saving our own soul and saving those around us. So she says, we now have to do the penance. You know, we have to pick up our rosaries and pray. We have to do the penance because it, the call is not coming from somewhere else. There's no one else who's sort of going to you know, rally us to that. It's not going to happen, she said. And so I see that's kind of true. Ever since, I mean, right after that is, is when all the disciplines actually went the other way. They began getting lax. We have less holy days of obligation. We have less feasts, we have less penance, we have a lot less of this reparation that we need to be doing. So we see a great continuity between those two. I was talking about preparing us for future trials, and the fifth reason was to increase piety. Both Lourdes and Fatima definitely did that, and also to manifest the unity between the church triumphant, the church suffering, and the church militant. Another reason why God gives us this private revelation where Our Lady comes. And you certainly see that both at Lourdes and Fatima you know, the prayer for the souls in purgatory, the intercession of the saints, those kinds of things. So very briefly now, just these major apparitions, and each one is, is wonderful with a lot more information that I can give, but I just want you to get a sort of sense of the continuity and the importance that God is taking care of us, his great providence for both him and his mother for us across time. So I'll go to the very first Marian apparition that we have on record. <clears throat> And that actually took place in 40, that's 40 AD. So our Blessed Mother is actually still alive. Maybe better than an apparition, it could be called a bilocation. St. James was in, this is St. James, the brother of John, the Sons of Thunder. St. James was evangelizing in Spain, and he was not meeting with a lot of success. And so he was actually praying to God, and he was near a city called Zaragoza, and Our Lady appeared to him on a pillar. And I mean, it's a wonderful message she gives him. She says, my son James, this place, the most high and omnipotent God of heaven, has destined to be consecrated by thee. And so I just stop right there because you already see this concept of consecration to set something apart for God, which is central to the role of Fatima, how she wants us consecrated to her immaculate heart. She wants Russia consecrated to her immaculate heart. Already you see that this is part of God's plan, this consecration, setting aside a people or a thing or a person, a country for himself. So already Our Lady is speaking this way at that time. Uh, this place is to be destined, consecrated by thee upon earth for the erection of a house of prayer, a church, where under my patronage and my name, God wishes to be glorified and magnified, and where the treasures of his right hand shall be opened up for all the faithful through my intercession. I mean, if we just take that little bit, and she gave, there's more to the message there. Of, she's called Nuestra Señora del Pilar, Our Lady of the Pillar, because she appeared on a pillar. Uh, but if we just take that, I mean, you see really there is the plan of God, that the churches will be erected, that this whole world could become a church, a house of prayer where God is glorified, God's mighty right hand. Anytime you hear that mighty right hand, that's the battle language, God leading his armies into battle to dispel this plan of the devil that we're talking about, and where he'll be glorified and magnified both because of the conquest of his enemies, but because the people that are faithful to him glorify and magnify him. But all this happens again, and the treasures are being opened. So graces are flooding over us through the intercession of Our Lady. Right? So Our Lady being the mediatrix of all graces. So already you see very much the role that Our Lady has. And really, when you study each one of these apparitions, if you have a good understanding of Mary, a uh, Mariology, a solid Mariology, you will see that Mariology being manifested throughout, just like if you have a good understanding of the church, ecclesiology, or of our Lord's salvation, soteriology, there, God is always giving us really the same lesson again and again, so that we'll learn it. I'll fast forward now to 1214, when Our Lady appears to St. Dominic near Toulouse, France. St. Dominic was trying to convert the Albigensian heretics, and he wasn't having any success. So, 
Our Lady appears and says, you'll have success if you preach the rosary and preach nothing but the rosary. And so that is in 1214, Our Lady giving St. Dominic the rosary. That's obviously going to come again and again in Lourdes and in Fatima. One of the most beautiful connections between Lourdes and Fatima is that at Fatima, every single time she appears, she says, pray the rosary, pray the rosary, pray the rosary every day. She never stops saying that. And at Lourdes, a good priest friend of mine has done this wonderful analysis where he basically says, there's 15 apparitions at Lourdes because there's 15 mysteries of the rosary that Our Lady asks us to pray. And he's actually gone and done an analysis of what happens at each one of those 15 apparitions. And there's a deep connection to the 15 mysteries of the rosary. He, can, he does this entire meditation on how the first time that Our Lady comes at Lourdes, it's like the Annunciation. And then the second time, all the elements are connected to the visitation. And on and on it goes like that. It's interesting because I think it's the fifth one because it's the finding of our Lord in the temple when Bernadette shows up and Our Lady's not there. There's that missing element, just like our Lord had gone missing in the fifth. So there's these wonderful connections. So it's sort of like the mysteries of the rosary are being lived out by Our Lady at Lourdes in these apparitions. Again, I, that talk, it's actually online, and if anyone's interested, I can get you those talks, but um, that would take longer. I just want you to know that there's this deep connection. Of course, Our Lady is praying the rosary at Lourdes. Many people don't know, but when you have sort of like a more authentic statue of Our Lady of Lourdes, the rosary she's holding actually has six decades, not just five. Because what Our Lady asked at Lourdes was that we pray an extra decade of the rosary for the poor souls in purgatory. Again, remember, one of the reasons that we get these private revelations is to strengthen things that are being neglected, to strengthen the community between the church militant, church suffering, and church triumphant. And so there you see that very clearly at Lourdes with Our Lady saying, the holy souls in purgatory need prayers. Just like at Fatima, she gives us this decade prayer that we pray. Oh my Jesus, forgive us our sins, save us from the fires of hell, lead all souls to heaven, especially those most in need. Who are the most in need? Well, I mean, there's a lot of people that are in need, but I think clearly the most in need are the holy souls in purgatory because they cannot help themselves. If you're in heaven, well, you're in heaven. If you're in hell, well, you're there and you're staying there. If you're on earth, you can still do something and you can still help yourself. But when you're in purgatory, you can no longer do anything to help yourself. You are completely dependent upon those that are in the church militant or those in the church triumphant. So they're like the most in need. So when you're praying your rosary and you're praying that Fatima Decade prayer, you're praying for the holy souls and others, of course. But remember, they're sort of front and, front and center that we have to be praying for the holy souls. Again, more connections there between Lourdes and Fatima. Then she appears to St. Simon Stock in 1251 and she gives him the brown scapular, a sign of salvation, saying, take this scapular, it will be a sign of salvation, a protection in danger and a pledge of peace. Whoever dies wearing this scapular shall not suffer eternal fire. Wear it devoutly and perseveringly. It is my garment. To be clothed in it means you are continually thinking on me, and I in turn am always thinking on you and helping you to secure eternal life. So there's a wonderful promise with the brown scapular, but it's not superstitious and it's not magical. You can't put a scapular on and then just sin impiously, brazenly, and think, well, I get to go to heaven because I have a brown scapular on. There's been people who try that, and when they die, we find out that the scapular somehow came off them. You know, Our, our Lady and God, they're not going to be fooled. You can't sort of play games with them. It doesn't work that way. Not when God's all-powerful, almighty, and omnipotent, and perfect justice and perfect mercy. Uh, so she says, wear it devoutly and perseveringly. So there's a devotion that's attached to it. To be clothed in it means you're thinking on me. You're always thinking about Our Lady. As you're thinking about Our Lady, then that means your thoughts become like her thoughts. And again, we get to what we said last night about Fatima, that your heart begins to be more and more like the Immaculate Heart. If you're thinking like her, ultimately, what are you going to be doing? You're going to be saying, not my will, but God's will. And that's to think like Our Lady. And then she's thinking on you and she's taking care of you as well because you're clothed in her garment. You're wearing her habit. That's ultimately what the scapular is. It's the Carmelite habit. 
and that's what the scapula is, and that's why it goes over the shoulder. Uh, it's basically you are a third order Carmelite, and you get to participate in all the graces and the merits of the entire Carmelite order, of whom Mary is the queen and the foundress. So you belong to her in a very special way, and she loses nothing that God entrusts to her. And Our Lady of Guadalupe in 1531, Our Lady comes and says, am I not here who am your mother? Why are you worried? You have nothing to worry about. Come to me, bring me all your concerns. Again, build a great church here. We'll all intercede for you. But just that wonderful refrain, am I not here who am your mother? Are you not in the crossing of my arms? There's no need to worry when our blessed mother is going to take care of us. And that's really, again, the message at Fatima. Come to your mother. At Lourdes, come to your mother. So throughout time, she's giving us this very important message. Then we have the Sacred Heart appearing to St. Mary Margaret Alacoque in the 1600s, 1670s, establishing like the First Friday devotion, following the teaching of great saints like St. John Eudes and St. Louis de Montfort, who preached the Immaculate Heart and the Sacred Heart. And France was in a terrible time where Jansenism was growing and Gallicanism were growing. These are two terrible heresies. Where basically, there was a lot of pride. There was a lot of presumption. There was a denial of God's mercy. There was a denial of the humanity of God. They didn't like the Sacred Heart image. I mean, France really needed the devotion to the Sacred Heart at that time to dispel these errors of the Jansenists. And that's what St. John Eudes and St. Louis de Montfort and other great saints preach, but especially through the Sacred Heart devotion. That's what France needed at that time, and that's really what we still need. But you see a great connection between the Sacred Heart coming first and preparing us for then the Immaculate Heart coming at the time of Fatima, and the First Friday devotion and the First Saturday devotion, that they're connected. Then we really reach a new era, and I call this more the Marian era. We really are in a Marian era right now. And St. Louis de Montfort, for example, predicts that that's coming. He dies in 1716. It's when St. Louis de Montfort dies. So it's on the verge of the French Revolution. He talked about his writings would be lost, and they were lost for a while during the French Revolution. But the French Revolution really does see a sort of amping up, a, a more intensification of the Devil's Revolution. They specifically wanted to destroy altar and throne, destroy the order of Christendom, and create a new world order in which God was denied and God didn't exist. Uh, in which there could be one world religion that ultimately is the Antichrist religion, where man is worshipped, and the Antichrist comes and places himself in the temple. And the temple in Jerusalem is rebuilt. So God has not allowed the temple in Jerusalem to be rebuilt. But again, the church fathers tell us that at one point in time, it finally will be rebuilt. And most likely, it is the Antichrist who will rebuild the temple in Jerusalem, and then he's going to set himself up in the temple to be worshipped. So once that starts happening, that's when you really know that we are at the end of the world. And they may try it because we're getting close to an end of an age, as I said yesterday. So just like the devil amped up his revolution, so God begins to amp up the graces. And I think the, the main event that marks that sort of increase naturally happens in France because that's where the French Revolution took place. So it's 1830 in Paris on a street called the Rue de Bac where she appears to St. Catherine Labore and gives her the miraculous medal. So where that miraculous medal is, worked many, many miracles. And just a few things about it, obviously on the back of the miraculous medal, again, you see the sacred heart and you see the immaculate heart. And they're together and they're intertwined. So we're in this new time. I mean, God, God's giving us the same message. And one of the things that was so interesting was that Our Lady had all these rings and light. So we call her Our Lady of Grace very often. And she was stepping on the serpent in that. You'll see that on the image of the miraculous medal. She's stepping on the devil back to Genesis 3.15. She has these rings and they're giving out light, great graces, but some of the rings were, were not giving out light. And so St. Catherine Labre's attention was drawn to that and she asked, why? And Our Lady said very simply, it's because I have all these graces to give, but no one's asking for them. And so that's why these rings are not giving out light. They're all the graces that could be given to mankind, but men are not asking for them. We're not praying for them. So she does have a lot of grace to give. We have to come and ask. And then after 1830, it seems like there's more and more authentic church-approved Marian apparitions. Uh, Our Lady of La Salette is very important. She appears in 1846, September 19th, to two shepherd children in the high Alps of the France, southern France, Melanie Calvat and Maximin Girard. And she tells them primarily that God is going to punish the world because of violations of the second and third commandments. The first three commandments are not being followed. God's honor is not being respected. And she says she's trying to hold back the wrath. 
She goes on to say, do you say your prayers well, my children? Good question that you could ask each one of us. Do we say our prayers well? Back to the concept that people aren't praying, which is why, for example, at Lourdes, she comes and teaches how to pray. She teaches Bernadette how to pray correctly. And then just watching Bernadette, you learn to pray better. She teaches the children at Fatima how to pray. The angel comes and teaches them how to pray, and then they imitate what the, pray, what the angel's doing. The same thing for us. We need to look at those apparitions and look at what our Blessed Mother is doing and learn how to pray through what she tells us and through what the seers that got to see her, what they learned. She also went on to say at La Salette, the priests, the ministers of my son, the priests, by their wicked lives, by their irreverence and their impiety in the celebration of the holy mystery, by their love of money, their love of honors and pleasures, the priests have become cesspools of impurity. Yes, the priests are asking vengeance, and vengeance is hanging over their heads. Woe to the priests and to those dedicated to God, who by their unfaithfulness and their wicked lives are crucifying my son again. That was present in the 1800s. It's present right now, and it brings great sorrow to each of us to hear those words because we've not seen them so much on the lips of Our Lady as prophecies, but we've seen them splattered across our newspapers. You now we hear the stories of a priest who might be wearing his clerics and just the abuse he might get as he's walking through a public airport or some other place because of all these scandals that have hit us. We're still dealing with that. She says, the society of men is on the eve of the most terrible scourge and of the greatest events. Mankind must expect to be ruled with an iron rod and to drink from the chalice of the wrath of God. There is more to the message of Our Lady of La Salette, but we should be listening. We should be hearing her. Then our Lord appears to Sister Marie de Saint-Pierre, a Carmelite nun in France, all of these, by the way, taking place in France. I think that's very significant for a lot of reasons, not just the fact that France is where the revolution started, the French Revolution that really infects the rest of the modern world, but also because France has always been the eldest daughter of the church. Why is France called that? Because after the fall of the Roman Empire and we entered the Dark Ages and barbarians ran across what had been the civilized world, it's the Franks who were the first people to get baptized and to become Christian. So France becomes the first Christian nation at that time under King Clovis, who had a very saintly wife, St. Saint Clotilde, and a very holy bishop, Bishop Remigius. And there was a great battle that he won over uh, Germanic barbarians. And because of that, he gets baptized in 496. So that's how France becomes Catholic. And then it just grows from there. And they begin to spread the faith Eventually, we're going to get to Charlemagne at 800, but there were others. I mean, Charles Martel in 712, defeating the Moors and keeping them out of Europe. And then Pepin the Short, defending the papacy against the Lombard barbarians in Italy and giving the Pope the Papal States. And then Charlemagne, the grandson of Charles Martel, reestablishing the Holy Roman Empire. And the Pope himself, Pope Leo II, comes and crowns him on Christmas Day in 800 AD. That sort of marks... Christ the King coming to rule once again after these dark periods when many have been baptized. France took a lead in all of that. So because of that, she's called the eldest daughter of the church. So that's God's plan unfolding. I don't know why God has chosen France for this special role, but he clearly has. He wanted the nation consecrated to his sacred heart. And so then the devil targets that as well in his plan and brings about this diabolical revolution in France that then begins to spread everywhere. So France still has a significant role to play in the future. Uh, there's prophecies about a French monarch that is coming. But this is also why I believe many of these apparitions were taking place in France, because God was giving them the special graces that they needed. We should pay attention to that. So La Salette, devotion to the Holy Face, specifically given to use the weapons of Christ's passion to defeat the errors of revolutionary men and communists. So that came in 1847. So learn about those prayers. Pray those prayers. They're very, very powerful, and they do much to appease God. They do much for reparation. That whole sort of revelation that our Lord gave Sister Marie de Saint-Pierre is called the work of reparation. 
capital W, capital R, the work of reparation. We should all be doing it and praying those prayers. Some of them are very short, and really you can become a member of the Ajkan fraternity, and it only adds like a couple of minutes of prayer to your day. I mean, two minutes that we could all be doing. Again, if you want to learn more, we have the literature back there that explains that, but it's a very powerful devotion given specifically because God said, now in these days, I'm going to allow my wrath to come over the earth in the form of men, evil men who want to do evil things. So it's not just going to be plagues and locusts and some of the other things you may have read about in the Old Testament and other you know, things that uh, have been used in the past, but he said specifically evil men would undermine the very foundations of society these revolutionary men, and God's allowing that. So God is allowing that particular punishment because, again, we're not doing what Arlie is saying. We're not doing the penance. We're not obeying. We're not converting. We're not offering reparation as we should. And so this is the just punishment that, we are, that we're getting as, as, a, as a whole, as a society. I'm not saying any individual person, although I'm sure we all bear some guilt in it. And then comes the Immaculate Conception appearing to Bernadette at Lourdes, which I've already mentioned at length. Uh, it's the apparition where she's worked the most miracles that have actually been verified by scientists, doctors, medical doctors, the church. It was a time when we needed that grace, a time when people needed to believe in the supernatural again, where rationalism and the enlightenment, and sort of science was winning the day and anybody who was a believer was looked upon as backwater and ignorant and how can you believe those religious superstitions and that was the whole rage in the 1800s, and it's still with us today, but that's really when it was, it was very powerful and in all the universities and everywhere. And so does Our Lady come. She comes and she says, I am the Immaculate Conception, and I'm going to give you all these great miracles so you believe in the supernatural again. But again, pray the rosary. Penance, penance, penance. So she gives us a great grace to fill us with confidence. And in many ways, we, we don't quite listen. And then comes Our Lady of the Rosary at Fatima. That's actually the name she gave herself when they asked her her name. She, she called herself, she identified herself at Fatima. We always call her Our Lady of Fatima. That's the place she appeared, but that's not how she referred to herself. She actually called herself Our Lady of the Rosary. So that's her proper title at Fatima, self-designated by the Mother of God. Uh, so she comes again at Fatima. We talked a bit more about that yesterday to remind us that souls are falling into hell like snowflakes that the errors of Russia are gonna spread across the face of the earth, that men will lose their faith, will be diabolically disoriented. And of course, we're not, as I mentioned earlier, even to look now, we can't look to the leaders of our church because for that call to penance, but we've gotta pick it up and do it ourselves. She warns about martyrdom coming, about great persecutions of the church, and how the devil is in the mood for a final and decisive battle with the virgin. So he's trying to scramble as fast as he can. He knows his time is short. He knows his time is almost up. And so he's trying to do everything he can just as fast as he can to grab as many souls as he can before that triumph of the Immaculate Heart where Our Lady will crush him. Then comes Our Lady of Akita. Hopefully you're familiar with that. Uh, a weeping statue, a miraculous statue. Again, church approved. And I'll just mention some of the things she said on October 13th, obviously, again, a very significant day tying us back to Fatima, October 13th, 1973. So that's not that long ago. She appeared to Sister Agnes Sasagawa there in Akita, Japan. And she really emphasized one of the biggest things she talks about is Jesus is truly present in the Eucharist. So that's one of the central messages of Akita. And you can see again why she was saying that. A lot of times these private revelations to strengthen things that are being neglected, to strengthen things that are under attack or being denied that are part of public revelation that we need for salvation. We need this belief of our Lord in the Eucharist for salvation. And, and we're forgetting about it. So many Catholics don't believe today. I know you've read the polls in the pew and things like that that are done, that the vast majority of Catholics, those who call themselves Catholics and are baptized Catholics, no longer believe that Jesus Christ is really present, body, blood, soul, and divinity in the most holy sacrament to the altar. And they certainly don't act that way. We certainly don't act like we give due reverence to our Lord. Well, that's one of the main messages of Akita, that, that Jesus is truly present in the Eucharist, and we need to give him due reverence, and then offer the reparation for the sacrilege against it. She again reminds us to pray very much for the Pope and the bishops and the priests, which was echoing, again, Fatima. At Fatima, the same thing. I mean, St. Jacinta came away from that saying, like, it was going to be her personal mission to pray for the Pope 
And she never stopped praying for the Pope. She always prayed for the Pope. Um, we have to be doing that as well. It's, it's very important to pray for the Pope every day. Hopefully at the end of your rosary, you pray for the Pope every day. And the Popes need a lot of prayers because the devil's attacking the Pope more than he's attacking you or me. If he takes down the Pope, he takes down billions of Catholics. Right? If he takes down just one soul here or there, why waste his effort there? He goes after the big, big bulwarks. He goes after the priests and the bishops and the Pope because he knows if he can drag one of those souls to hell, thousands and millions more come with it. And so then it's our responsibility and come on us to pray more for them, to do more penance for them. These are some of the things she said on October 13, 1973. The work of the devil will infiltrate even into the church in such a way that one will see cardinals opposing cardinals and bishops against other bishops. Perhaps in 1973, that was unthinkable because there was such unity among the episcopacy. But today, again, that's not a prophecy. That's just news that's being reported all over the, all, over, all the time. Right? We see Bishop Strickland saying this, and we see... Uh, Archbishop Cordeleone denying Nancy Pelosi communion. And Nancy Pelosi flies to the Vatican and receives communion there. And we see the bishops of Germany saying that they're going to break off and create their own church that can ordain women. You know, and you see the bishops in Africa saying, no, you can't do that. And you can't allow contraception and abortion. And then you have other, I mean, it's, 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 it's a nightmarish mess for us. And we're caught in the crossfire. But again, Our Lady warned us about these things. So she continues from Akita. <clears throat> The priests who venerate me will be scorned and opposed by their confreres. So other priests and other bishops scorning the very priests who are marrying. Churches and altars will be sacked. We just saw these race riots. I mean, did you know what happened to churches in Canada? I mean, they were getting sacked and destroyed and statues were being desecrated all the last couple of years and the police and the state do nothing. Oh, it's a Catholic church that got desecrated, that got broken into, that got vandalized. It's okay. Notre Dame gets burned down. Arsonry. I mean, churches being sacked. That's happening now. We're living. We're seeing it. Our Lady was telling us about it. So take these prophecies seriously. It's not like Our Lady doesn't know what it's talk she's talking about. These are real. She was warning us, preparing us. The church will be full of those who accept compromises. And the devil will press many priests and many consecrated souls to leave the service of the Lord. The demon would be especially implacable against souls consecrated to God. <clears throat> the thought of the loss of so many souls is the cause of my sadness. If sins increase in number and gravity, there will no longer be any pardon for sins. And these are very, very frightful and frightening words of Our Lady. You know, what are we hurling towards? She continues, as I told you, if people do not repent and better themselves, the Father will inflict a terrible punishment on all of humanity. In other places, for example, in Fatima, she says both the good and the evil, I mean, both the good and the bad are going to get, are, are going to be suffering this terrible chastisement. It will be a punishment greater than the flood, such as one which has never been seen before. Fire will fall from the sky and will wipe out a great part of humanity the good as well as the bad, sparing neither the priests nor the faithful. The survivors will find themselves so desolate that they will envy the dead. The only arms which will remain for you will be the rosary and the sign left by my son, the holy sign of the cross, very powerful sacramental. Each day recite the prayers of the rosary. With the rosary, pray for the pope, the bishops, and the priests. So again, that's Our Lady of Akita. Um, as far as I know, it's the most recent fully church-approved apparition, Marian apparition, that's taken place. And we need to heed her words and take them very seriously. We are getting closer and closer to the time where this will become a reality. Again, they're conditional prophecies. We can't stop them. We just have to obey the message of Fatima, as I was speaking about last night. And the twelfth one I'll mention today is just when Our Lady appeared as Our Lady of Good Success to Mother Mariana in Quito, Ecuador. Her body's uh, incorrupt. I've actually been privileged to stand right next to it. 
and it was just lying on a table. It wasn't even in a sarcophagus. Now they have it in a sarcophagus. Now I've got my rosaries and scapulars attached to her so they could become third-class relics. But I mean, 400 years later, and her body is incorrupt, and you can see it just right there. It's, it's, it's really phenomenal. And I mention it now at the end just because Our Lady made many promises or prophecies about things that would happen. And unlike many other apparitions, she clearly identifies a time period. So in the 1600s, she said these things are going to happen at the end of the close of the 1800s. And she gave prophecies about Ecuador. She actually predicted that there would be a great Catholic president, that's Gabriel Garcia Moreno, who would be martyred and assassinated by Freemasons. And that's exactly what happened. Um, he's probably the greatest Catholic president of any modern republic that has ever existed. So a great, great man to study. Again, Gabriel Garcia Moreno. Uh, he, as president, got the state legislature to consecrate the nation of Ecuador to the Sacred Heart. And they held legislative sessions, and they voted. And they said, our nation, we consecrate. Imagine that. Imagine if up on Capitol Hill in D.C., our senators and our House of Representatives got together and the president said, I'm going to put this bill forward that we consecrate the United States to the sacred heart of Jesus. And they voted and they signed it. That's what they did down there in Ecuador. And then they took the state funds and began to build this great, great cathedral to the sacred heart. And you can still go see it there. And it's an amazing testament. And they built another great, great column to Our Lady. And in 1891, the bishops got together by then. Gabriel Garcia Moreno was assassinated, so he couldn't see that. But then the nation in 1891 was consecrated to the Immaculate Heart. I mean, that's pretty, that's some powerful stuff. I mean, something special is also going to happen there in Ecuador. So it's a great place to go on pilgrimage. I've gone there many times and led pilgrim groups. Um, haven't been able to go, obviously, in the last few years because of all the travel restrictions that we're all aware of. But perhaps, uh, perhaps Our Lady will give me the grace to go again. So she appears there, and these are some of the things that she told Mother Mariana. Again, back in the 1600s, there's a great book. If you just look it up, Our Lady of Good Success by Mary Ann Horvath. Uh, you know, that kind of has the whole story and a lot of the prophecies and things. I'm just going to give you a, a quick smattering of a few of the things she's talked about. She said that primarily in the 20th century, and what she did, she did something very visual, a prophetic act. Our Mother Mariana was in the sanctuary. She's praying. They had a choir loft, and so she's praying in the choir loft, and she, uh, she sees that suddenly the red sanctuary light is just blown out and disappears. And so Mother Mariana was made to realize that this happened because it was symbolizing that the faith was going to be lost, that the faith was going to be changed, that it's as if we couldn't find Christ in our churches anymore. That, that time was coming on account of, she said, three things, heresy, blasphemy, and impurity. So heresy is all the false dogma. Those are the powers of hell being released. Blasphemy. It's all those violations of the first, second, and third commandment that Our Lady of La Salette is talking about, Our Lady of Fatima is talking about. The greatest sins of men are the violations of the first three commandments. And then impurity. The fact that you can no longer find a pure soul, but even children would be immodest and impure. So those are these three great sins. And she says a sword is hanging over like the neck of mankind. And it's these three sins that are going to have that sword fall. That's already what she's saying, Our Lady of Good Success. Uh, again, in Quito, Ecuador. So these are some of the things that she told Mother Mariana. Thus I make it known to you that from the end of the 19th century and from shortly after the middle of the 20th century, the passions will erupt and there will be a total corruption of customs. By custom, she means like manner, proper behavior. For Satan will reign almost completely by means of Masonic sex. They will focus in particular on the children in order to sustain this general corruption. And then she goes and one by one mentions the sacraments and how the sacraments are going to be desacralized, how they'll be, how great blasphemies will be done. For example, as for the sacrament of matrimony, which symbolizes the union of Christ with his church, it will be attacked and profaned in the fullest sense of the word. Freemasonry, which will then be in power, will enact iniquitous laws with the aim of doing away with this sacrament, making it easy for everyone to live in sin, to encourage the procreation of illegitimate children born without the blessing of the church. The Catholic spirit will rapidly decay and the precious light of faith will gradually be extinguished 
until it reaches the point that there will be an almost total and general corruption of customs. Added to this will be the effects of secular education, which will be one reason for the death of priestly and religious vocations. So again, we see the crisis in vocations that she's talking about. We also see how there is a specific element of the errors of Russia, of the revolutionary men, to attack and target children and to destroy their innocence and to attack and target the family. Marriage and family are under great attack. That was actually one of the other themes I just thought about and discussed with, uh, with Neil as we considered these talks is if we should just focus on the attack on marriage and the family, which, which is part of what Our Lady was saying and it's a very important element. Um, but I think you know how much the marriage and the family are under attack. Well, Our Lady is warning us to those things as well. She continued, further, in these unhappy times, there will be unbridled luxury, which will ensnare the rest into sin and conquer innumerous, innumerable frivolous souls that will be lost. Innocence will almost no longer be found in children, nor modesty in women. And in this supreme moment of need of the church, the ones who should speak will fall silent. Once again, Our Lady prophesying that these things would happen after the middle of the 20th century. Sounds a lot like what she's saying at Fatima and what she's saying at Akita. Same lady, same message, same plan that God is giving us. Our Lady of Good Success continued, during this period, there will be great physical and moral calamities, both private and public. The small number of souls who hidden will, will preserve the treasure of the faith, this sounds a lot like Fatima, where she says that in Portugal, the dogma of the faith will be preserved, and that in many other places, it's obviously not going to be preserved. There's a small sort of hidden number of souls that are preserving the faith. Um, the small number of souls who hidden will preserve the treasure of the faith, and the virtues will suffer an unspeakable, cruel, and prolonged martyrdom. I, I will just stop right there for a moment, because I know this has brought some consolation to people. Um, I don't know how each of you is, is sort of, let's say... Uh, suffering in your own marriages. Um, but I have been talking to a number of priests and a number of Catholics, especially it seems among Catholics who are really trying to be faithful Catholics and who are really trying to, to live their marriage as well and are trying to you know, embrace and recover tradition. I don't think I know of one family, of one marriage that is not suffering terribly right now in, in very strange and odd ways, like ways that maybe they don't even understand sometimes. Uh, fights between husband and wife, and, and sometimes the husband's sort of sitting there like, how is this happening? Like, like, you don't even have a full understanding of why there seems to be this great tension between you and your spouse. Um, and, and some of them, of course, people are ending in divorce. They're, they're kind of giving up. Um, it's, it's something that I see certainly across the U.S., and a number of priests have been talking to me about it, that they're like, I, I mean, confessions, what I'm hearing there, and that there seems to be this great trend, if you will, right now, where marriages are suffering an amazing amount. So one priest who I believe is connected with, with priests who, who are in the battle of exorcists basically said, look, it's that the devil has been given a special power in these times because of our sins to really attack marriage and family. And he's especially going after those marriages where the couples are trying to live the Catholic faith. Maybe they're trying to pray. Maybe they're trying to say the rosary. Maybe they're trying to raise their children right and that he's really attacking them. And then as I just start talking to friends and people I know, I've really seen them under attack. And so there's, there's stuff you gotta do about that. You gotta engage in spiritual warfare. That is, by the way, one of the reasons I brought a book that's in the back called Prayers of Deliverance by the Lady, um, because it is a real spiritual warfare and we've gotta start praying some of these prayers. You know, husbands, pray them for your wives. Wives, pray them for your husbands. Pray them for your children. Um, because if the devil's been given these extra permissions on account of sin to attack us in this special way, we also need these weapons to attack back and to defend ourselves. Um, so uh, I, I've certainly been seeing that a lot and, and do want to talk about that element of it. But again, it's here in the message of Our Lady's plan and God's plan. So we're being warned about these things. Uh, again, these, these people who are trying to actually preserve the faith are enduring a prolonged martyrdom. I mean, if you're in a marriage and, for example, I mean, I knew one gentleman, he basically said, like, like my wife just lost it. Like, I, I don't even know why, I don't even know how it happened, but my wife kind of like, you know, went crazy, it seems. And she was this one way before, and then she started doing all these other things. And, and I don't know what to do. And then my wife, like, leaves. And then she became, like, this radical feminist. You know, I mean, she was this Catholic who was a homeschooling mom and a housewife and has, like, six kids. I forget what. And they're, like, up and all. I mean, in, in a very quick transformation. He's like, I, I didn't know what to do. And then what, is it, what does the father do? 
left with like the six kids. I mean, it's, it's really, talk about a prolonged martyrdom. Very, very difficult pain to endure. Incredibly difficult. It's almost like we say, I'd rather get thrown in the concentration camp and not be given food and water than suffer that kind of emotional and spiritual trauma with, with your loved ones. So I don't know if people are going through that or if you know that people are going through that, but maybe they might take some consolation in realizing that, that this is everywhere right now. It's like this massive attack that we're experiencing. Our Lady continued, in order to free men from the bondage to these heresies, those whom the merciful love of my most holy son will destine for that restoration will need great strength of will, constancy, valor, and much confidence in God. To test this faith and confidence of the just, there will be occasion when everything will be seen to be lost and paralyzed. This then will be the happy beginning of the complete restoration. And she talks about how there'll be a great prelate, you know, a bishop, a high-ranking churchman who will come and who will begin to restore the priesthood. So there is a, a great restoration coming. Our Lady talks about it, even in the 1600s. That dovetails perfectly with this triumph of the Immaculate Heart and how things are going to get very, very dark and very, very bleak. And just when it all seems lost and everything seems paralyzed and nothing seems like it's going to work and we're suffering cruel martyrdoms and those who should speak our leaders fall silent and don't proclaim the truth, then will be the happy time of restoration. And it'll be that great triumph with that great reversal God can be honored and glorified because he's vanquished this enemy and the humble maiden will step and crush on the proud head of the serpent. So that is all coming. And so I bring this all up, I guess, to just reemphasize the message of Fatima. <clears throat> I do hear sometimes people say, well, Fatima is just a private devotion. You can take it or leave it. Marian devotion is private devotion. You can take it or leave it. I'm here to tell you that's completely false and that's a lie of the devil. First of all, Marian devotion is not a private devotion. You cannot take it or leave it. I actually have a whole talk that I could give you quoting so many saints, doctors of the church and popes, like infallible teaching that says Mary is necessary and essential for salvation. You need a Marian devotion for salvation. And even more so in these times, that's why we're in this Marian age. And Fatima, because of its nature, because she called out something from all of us and something from the bishops and something from the pope, has a public character. And you don't even have to take that from me. John Paul II himself, when he was Pope, said that. He said that Fatima has this public character, making an imposition on the entire church and every member of the church. Benedict said similar things. He said, those who think Fatima is over deceive themselves. The events of Fatima are still unraveling before our eyes. He said that just in 2010, in May, when he visited Fatima. So, this is imperative. This is necessary. We must live the message. It's not a changing message. It's the same message. It's ultimately the message of the gospel, but it's God has always been giving it to us. The devil is always trying to undermine it, and Our Lady is here to win and to defeat it. And we just have to cling to her and obey her and follow her message. So I'll just conclude reminding you that the message of Fatima, the way you can live it and what you can do, because I know people ask that, like, why you said all these things, and I'm a little worried now. What am I supposed to do? Well, it's very simple. What you're supposed to do, and we have that mnemonic device, Roman Catholic SOS. Send up your Roman Catholic SOS to heaven and to Our Lady. So be a Roman Catholic. Make sure you're baptized. I imagine everyone here is, but there are people who are not. You know, you have to be baptized because otherwise we're not in a state of grace and none of our actions can gain any merit. We can't do any reparation, all these things that are so necessary. So you've got to be baptized and you have to be in a state of grace. You can't be in a mortal sin. So if you have any mortal sin, you've got to get rid of that. Confession is so important. So... Stay in a state of grace, cease offending God. That's baseline Catholicism. And then the R's for the rosary, pray the rosary every day. Pray five decades of the rosary every day and try to pray them more faithfully. That's the R for Roman. The C for Catholic is consecration. Consecrate yourself to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. I always recommend St. Louis de Montfort's method to consecrate yourself and pray for the consecration of Russia. The S is for the scapular, the brown scapular. Wear the brown scapular. If you're not invested in the brown scapular, get invested. A priest needs to invest you in the brown scapular. It only has to happen once. Scapulars actually don't have to be blessed. Once you're invested in the brown scapular, if one is old or worn, you just burn it or bury it, and then you just put on another one, but you have been invested. It attaches to the person because the scapular is the habit. O, offer prayer and penance. So offer prayer and penance, your daily duties, the state of your state in life. 
all the things that happened to you. Offer them up in reparation with the spirit of charity. And then the last S is the Saturday for the first Saturday devotion. Every month, practice that first Saturday devotion. Um, that's how we live this message, Roman Catholic SOS. We'll be faithful to Our Lady of Fatima. And if we get enough Catholics doing this, we're going to see that triumph. I mean, we can see it in our lifetime. It, it is just around the corner. I just don't know how long that corner is. But that's why it's so important to get this message out and for all of us to live faithfully. Our Lady has foretold it. It will get rough, but she will win. And her mad heart will triumph. And we're going to live in a great period of peace. If not us, maybe some of our descendants. But it is coming. So may God bless you.